All right, good morning. You guys all just quieted down as soon as that started. Hey, I wanna do this. Uh, this is our first time that we're streaming both services. So can we uh, give our online 915 first time ever welcome to Hamilton Hills. Welcome to the 915 service. Great job, yeah, that's really good. Hey, if, uh, if you're a guest, I wanna introduce myself. My name is Matt and I am one of the pastors on staff here, get the privilege of serving at what I would call the best church in the whole city, yet the whole world. And so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's good. There's two people here that believe that, so that's awesome. <laughs> hey, if you are a guest with us, if you'll look at the seat back in front of you, there should be a connection card. If you'll take that, fill it out any time during the service. We'd love to get a record of your visit, get to know you. Um, you can drop it off either in the boxes in the back or you can give it to someone on our Next Steps or uh, uh, New Here team and they have a gift for you just for being a guest with us. If you're watching online, we have a digital connection card that's in the description. You can fill that out obviously anytime during the service. Welcome to church. Well, uh, we have a lot of things going on. So we went and found the prettiest person that we could to do the video announcements. So if you'll turn your attention to the screen, Denise has something to tell us this morning. Good morning, church. Here's what's happening at Hamilton Hills. We have our 10 week discipleship experience called Rooted and it starts this month, September 26. So whether you're new in your faith or you've been a Jesus follower for decades, Rooted is a great way to continue your faith journey. Basically, if you haven't gone through Rooted, this class is for you. And you can sign up online using our website or see us in the next steps table in the lobby. Something else that's launching on September 26th is our connection groups. I love that here at Hamilton Hills Church, we do life together. We're family, and I promise that no matter what stage of life you're in, there's a group for you. So join the family, join a group. You can find more information about our fall semester groups online or go to our next steps table. All right, last announcement, but definitely not the least, is about our Operation Christmas Child. This is a program that allows us to bless boys and girls all over the world during this Christmas season. And here's how it works. We have boxes in the lobby ready for you to pick up. And along with the box, you will have a list of items to buy. And once you buy the items, you fill the box and we ask that you get together with your family or friends and pray over the children that will be receiving these boxes. Once you've done all that, bring it back to the church and we'll ship it out for you. Online, we would love for you to get connected as well. You can come by the church offices and pick up your box. Our family was part of this Operation Christmas Child last year, and I can't wait to do it again. Not only do we get to make a child's Christmas better through generosity, but we also get to help spread the gospel. All right, I'll see you in the lobby. Hey, also, uh, would you do this? Would you stand with me? We're gonna start our worship in just a moment, but before we do, we had over uh, 100 boxes picked up last week, so go ahead and give yourself a hand. Great job. <laughs> And excited to see what God's going to do this year through Operation Christmas Child. Um, I want to read a verse to you. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 20, the uh, Israelites are surrounded. Surrounded by actually three different armies. And they cry out to God and they say, man, there is absolutely no way that we are going to get out of this battle. And the leader of the Israelites speaks to him and from the word, from the voice of God. And he says this, listen, all you people of Judah and Jer Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army for the battle is not yours, but God's. I don't know what mess you're walking through right now. I don't know what you're trying to do to win that battle, but can I tell you that if you follow Jesus, you have a God that is not just powerful enough to win the battle, he has won the battle. That temptation, that thing you're going through, God has won the battle. We're starting a sermon this week, or not starting a sermon, we'll have a sermon this week, uh, but we're in the middle of a series called On Your Mark. 
We're going to be talking about immediate temptation because here's the thing. As soon as you decide to do something for God, the battle's coming. I'd like to get up here this morning and say, man, once you decide to follow Jesus, all your problems and temptations just go away. And it's all great. But the battle's coming. But here's what's awesome, and we're going to learn this today, is the battle belongs to God. So would you worship with us this morning? And before you do, can you just turn to your neighbor and say, the battle belongs to God. Go ahead, nice and loud. Let's do it again. A little bit louder than that. You guys sounded like maybe it was a little bit. There we go. Let's sing.
You know what? I just almost feel like, uh, like back in the day, I, I remember uh, like back in uh, the old school, yeah, you can have a seat. Back in the old school Baptist days, you know, sometimes the preacher would step up and he'd be like, you know what? Let's just keep singing, right? 
Man, that's the way I feel this morning. How about you? Hey, I need you to do me a favor. Um, I need you to look to the person to the left, the right of you, somebody like a neighbor, even if you don't know them. And I need you to say these three words. And I need you to say it with passion. I need you to look at them and say, it is written. On the count of three, I want you to say, it is written. One, two, three. Now look here, people, look here. Let's do better than that. And let me tell you why, let me tell you why. That's, that song we were just singing, Highest Praise, the, second, the, the song before the last song, Highest Praise, it has, it has, a, a, it has a, a line in there, did you see it, where it says, it is written, talking about how Jesus Christ has given his life for you and I. That word, it is written in the Greek is the word gagraptai. It is a perfect passive indicative, and you go, I don't care, pastor. Let me tell you why you should care. Let me tell you why you should care. Perfect passive indicative, when we tense the word gagraptai, it is written, means that what Jesus did for us was perfect, it can never be changed, and it stands for all time, people. What he did for you, the devil can't undo. You can't even undo what Jesus did for you. All the the sins we commit, the things we do that displease a holy God, because of Jesus Christ in our life, when we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior, we can't even undo what Jesus did for us on the cross. Is that not incredible? All right, so we're going to be talking about it is written this morning. I get the privilege uh, in our series uh, where today we're talking about immediate temptation, immediate temptation. Okay, and uh, so I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4. So it says in verse 9 of chapter 1, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, this is chapter 1 verse 9, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Verse 11, and a voice came from heaven. Now, this is where I wished I could speak some kind of cool language or something, right? You are my beloved son. This is the voice of the heavenly Father. You are are my beloved son with who I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. Now, don't ask me why Mark tells us this, but he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Well, I asked the question, why did Mark tell us he was with wild animals? And I found out that in that day and time, when Jesus was on the earth, where he was at in the wilderness, there would have been many wild lions. What does the, what does the Bible say about our adversary, the devil? What does the Bible say about him? It says that he what? He's like a, like a roaring lion. He, like, like he wants to, to devour us. He wants to, to destroy our lives. He wants to tear us apart. And Jesus immediately coming out of the water, right? So John the Baptist, you guys know the story about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus. So he's, he's baptizing people. He's saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And I got to be careful because I love preaching that. So I can't preach that to you this morning because it's not what it's about this morning. But John the Baptist is in the wilderness. He's a wild man. He's baptizing people. He's saying, get ready for the Lord. He's coming. And, 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 and then he's, Jesus comes and John the Baptist does what? He says, I must decrease and he must increase. And then he baptizes Jesus. And as soon as Jesus is coming out of the water, we hear the heavenly father saying, this is my son and who I am well pleased. Why would the father already be well pleased with his son, Jesus? Because he knew what Jesus was going to do. That marked the beginning of his ministry. Most theologians believe that when Jesus come out of that water, that that marked the beginning of, 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 his, of his ministry. So he, 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 he was born and he, he, he grew up and, and now he's, he's about 30 years old. And they believe that this, this marked the beginning of his ministry where he, would, where he would minister, right? And he would go to the cross and he would die on the cross and take our place. And then three days later, he would, he, he, he would rise again from the dead, right? And so the father is well pleased. This is a big deal in the scripture, right? 
And so immediately, as Jesus is getting ready to begin what we call his earthly ministry, he's tempted. God takes Jesus and leads him into a situation where he is tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. And I want you to take note that the enemy takes notice when we are living for God. Immediately, temptations will come when we surrender to do God's will. Immediately. Today, I could could tell you story after story after story about the temptations that I have faced in my life when I surrendered to be uh, in ministry. And, and we're not just talking about pastors. I'm talking, we're, this is about you. This is about you too. This is about when you get to the place in your life where the Holy Spirit is dealing with you and God is asking you to do something uh, for him to bring him honor and glory. And, and there's something he wants you to do by way of ministering in this earth. You can bet your bottom dollar that oftentimes there will be temptation. Temptation, something to come along and to keep you from doing that thing. It could be fear. What do, you, do you reckon being in the wild with the lions could have been a temptation to fear? It could be anxiety, right? It could be, it could be lust. It could be pride. I'm too good to do that. That's beneath me, right? It could be all of these kinds of things that the enemy uses to tempt you, to keep you from ministering for God and bringing him honor and glory and, and, and to take you away from that. The enemy takes notice when we are living for God. No sooner had Jesus come out of the water, the Spirit of God led him to, into a situation to be tested. Now, God is not the one tempting him. It's the devil that's on the scene that is soliciting the temptation. The beautiful thing about this test this is a little bit of a, a, a theological journey for, for, for us this morning. Some of you know this, some of you don't. And it's important to just tell you this. The, the theological piece of this, right, is Israel in the Old Testament was God's chosen. Israel in the Old Testament was God's beloved. And the beloved means Uh, He loved them more than he loved anything else in the earth. It denotes the strongest form of intimacy and affection you can have towards someone. And that's who Israel was to God. And Israel disobeyed God and wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years, going in circles because they would not obey God. Jesus is beginning his ministry, and he's led into the wilderness for 40 days. And there's a parallel here. And he is tempted, and yet without sin. You see, when we're tempted, we oftentimes sin. We're oftentimes enticed, and we're drawn away because of our own lust, and and then then the temptation, right, uh, becomes a sin. Jesus was tempted, fasting, no food, lions around him, and he did not sin. You see, we have a, uh, we have a saying around here that, that, the, uh, that, that life is messy. You guys ever heard that before around here? That's almost a joke to ask you that, right? Sin and temptation are part of the mess, church family. Sin and temptation are a part of the the mess of life. God offers a way to deal with the mess. He gives us tools that, 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 that he gives us things to equip us, to help us so that we won't sin. Psalm 119.11, the psalmist said, I hide your word in my heart, O God, that I might not sin against thee. Uh, Another weapon that we see in Scripture that helps us uh, to keep us from sinning is worship. That's why I like to drive a Harley and put a helmet on so that I can sing and you can't hear me because I'm not a worship leader. But the Word of God and worship are two of our offensive weapons that God gives us to help us and to keep us from sinning. Isn't that awesome? And one of the best things to do 
is to learn scripture and then to be able to sing that scripture back to God from your, from your heart. And to be able to pray that scripture back to God from your heart. And so God offers a way to deal with the mess, to avoid it. There's scriptures in places like Corinthians where it says that, that you're not tempted. Like, like when you're tempted, it's, it's not uncommon to man. It's something that we all face each and every day of our life is temptation. Has anyone in here never been tempted at any point in time in your life? I face temptations, I feel like, every day of my life. And it's not uncommon, the Apostle Paul said. But what he said is that when we are tempted, that God always provides a way of escape. There are things that he gives us that we can use in those moments. So here's what I want you to know. Being tempted is not sinning. Listen, listen, man and woman, being tempted is not sinning. So when you have that prideful thought, or when you have that lustful thought, in in, in that moment, in that moment, just just because something crosses your path, catches your eye, or you have a thought at work about being prideful or being, just because that stuff happens to you doesn't mean in that moment that you have sinned already. It is what you do with it. It is what you do with it. It's what you do with the temptation that determines the outcome. Jesus fasted for 40 days while being tested and tempted around wild animals, and he proved to be victorious. You say, well, I'm not Jesus. Well, I know that. I'm not either. But Jesus is my example, and Jesus is to be your example. Listen to what the Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 4. Starting with verse 14, it says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need. You see, Jesus has been tempted in every way likened unto us. There is nothing that we can go through in this earth that he cannot relate to. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor and counseling people, and people go through all kinds of things in their life, right? People, people go through horrible injustice in their, in their life. They go through things that we don't even want to think about in their life, and you, and, and, and you go to counsel them, and it's amazing that I haven't seen anything that anyone has ever went through where Jesus, where Jesus himself could not sympathize with what they were going through. That's amazing, church family, that we have a Savior who can understand any and everything we're tempted with or that we go through. Because he went through it all in some form or fashion while he was on this earth, and yet he did not sin. So I want to take you to Matthew chapter 4. It's, um, it's where Matthew dives into what Mark was talking about, and he gives a lot more information. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, starting with verse 1, we see where Jesus was tempted three times by the devil, And each time he quoted the word of God, leaving us an example on how to conquer temptation. So I'm going to show you in the next few minutes how through the temptation of Jesus, that nothing you can can go through is something that you can't conquer. Nothing that that you might go through is something that you can't conquer and be an overcomer and experience victorious living in that situation. And that Gagraptai word, it is written, is really important. Because, see, when we, when I, when we sing about that, like that highest praise song, I want to come out of my skin, I want to jump to the roof. Because, because when the Bible tells us it is written and that Jesus did for, that for us, I know it's true. And when you know something's true, then you can cling to it. 
You can trust in it. You, you can believe and know that that is a game changer in your life. And so Jesus is our example, and each time he is tempted, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Jesus refers back to the Scripture as a source of power and strength to overcome the devil's temptations. Here are the, here are the temptations, if you don't know, maybe you're new in, in, in your faith, or maybe you just never have, have, have heard this. Here, here are the temptations uh, that are common to man. If you look in 1 John, or just listen to me because this won't be on the screen. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are not from the Father, but according to John, they're from the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's quiet in here today. And I'm assuming it's because either you don't want to hear this or you're uncomfortable or trust me, I'm uncomfortable talking about this, okay? But this is, this is, this is the world we live in. We struggle with the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. Every single one of us do. Maybe for some of us it's more one or more the other. But in some way, because we live in this world and we live in this flesh and we have not seen Jesus yet face to face, then these are things that we have to deal with. And so when we pick up in the scriptures in Matthew chapter 4, we see temptation number one in the first four or five verses. Four, first four verses, we'll put that on the screen. The, the, uh, the, this one is the desires of the flesh or the lust of the flesh. Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Again, God puts him in this place of testing the theological significance for that church family. Listen to me. It's so Jesus could show you that he could do in 40 days what Israel couldn't do in 40 years. And he could obey God and surrender to God's will, and he did that for you and I. So Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and so we pick up where Mark left off, and now he has already fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and here comes the tempter. The tempter came and said to him, verse three, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And he answered, it is is written. Jesus says to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written. Israel, when they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years, God provided them bread and sustenance, and they partook, and yet they continued to disobey and they continued to wander around in circles for 40 years. Jesus is standing here in the wilderness, and he's being told after fasting and not having any food for 40 days by the enemy, guess what the enemy knew? He knew Jesus was what? Hungry. Guess what the, guess what the enemy knows about you in your life? He's, he's an observer of things. He knows what weaknesses are in your life. And trust me, he will push those buttons if he can. And if you crack the door, he will kick it wide open. The Bible tells us in Genesis that sin is like a, is like a, a crouching tiger waiting to pounce on us. And that's what, that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to take your weaknesses, and he wants to tempt you, and he wants you to sin, and he wants to, he wants to knock you down, and he wants to hurt you and harm you. So Jesus had been fasting. He comes to him and he says, hey, you know what? You know, listen, listen if, you, uh, you know, if you're the son of God, if. What do you mean if? Do you think that uh, Satan really doubted that Jesus was the son of God? So even in this moment, the deceiver is trying to get the Savior to doubt. See, 
Part of what he does in our lives is he wants us to doubt God, to distrust and to disregard God's truth in our lives. And Jesus says, it is written, and he doesn't eat the bread. This is amazing to me. He quotes God's word, and he believes his father and takes him at his word. And in the moment, it gives him strength, and he doesn't succumb to the, to the temptation of the evil one. Temptation number two, if you're taking notes. So that was the lust of the flesh, Matthew 4, verses 1 through Four, this is uh, temptation number two, the pride of life. In verses, starting with verse five, then the devil took him to the holy city and he set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Wow. Are you listening, church family? He takes him to the holy city. He takes him to a high place where you could see everything. And he said to him, if you're the son of God, Throw yourself down, but listen to what the devil does. Listen to what the enemy does. What does he say? What what does the enemy say? For it is what? Written. He tries to take the truth of God's word and use it against the Savior. Are you listening? He's the great deceiver. So he says, for it is written. He will give his angels orders concerning you. Hmm. What is, what is it? What is it? Uh, he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And what does Jesus say? He doesn't fall for him trying to take scripture and use it against the Savior and get the Savior manipulated into doing something that would be sinful against God. No, what what does our Savior do? He says, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. See, Satan quotes Scripture and he takes Scripture out of context. He's been doing that since the very beginning of, of, of humankind. Since the very beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth and everything in it and then, and then creating man and woman and we're the most prized of, of, of all of his creation as he seeks to have an intimate relationship with us different than anything else in this creation of his. And, and, and the enemy, when he showed up on the scene, he's been doing that from the beginning. Did God really say this? Is this really what God meant? This is what he's good at. It's a strategy of his. Temptation number three. If you're taking notes, the lust of the eyes. Verse eight, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Wow. I guess the devil forgot that God already owns it all. But he tries. Jesus says to him, be gone, Satan. Can you say it with me, church? For it is written. Let's try that one more time. Then then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written. And then he quotes scripture again. "You You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Each time Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus quoted scripture. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And so we talk about those wild animals in Mark 4. And it's like, well, why did he he mention that? Because he wanted us to know he was in a dangerous place. And then also remember in Mark 4, it said, and the angels were ministering to him. And so here's kind of the conclusion of this incredible story. As Jesus went through that 40 days, so God could show us through his example that by by knowing the word of God and by believing in God and by believing and trusting in what God has said, we can be overcomers. 
Is that not incredible? Three of the most powerful words in the universe are, it is written. And listen, I don't know what kind of wow factor this sermon has in your life. And, and, and here's what I need you to know, that the storytelling of today is actually about our Savior. We just learn from one of the, the, the happenings, one of the things that, that, that Jesus went through. And, 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 as, and, and we look to his example, and I just hope that you understand that, that that should be a wow factor in your life. And then when I say that three, these are the three of the most powerful words in the universe, like maybe nothing's going on inside of you right now. But if that's the case, I, I, I want to ask you to please reconsider that it is written are three of the most powerful words in the universe that from this day forward, Forward. You need to leave and understand that over your life and understand that the Word of God is something that you need in your life. We desperately need the Word of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. And so, you know, all the distractions and things we've been talking about through our last couple sermon series, all the things that are in the world, all the, the, these three temptations we're talking about today, we deal with them every day. And the more the enemy can keep our Bibles on the shelf or in the back seat of our car when we leave church on Sunday and we never pick it back up until the next Sunday, the better off he is with his strategy at, 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 at beating us up all the time. I won't ask you to do it again, but if you ever get asked again to look at your neighbor and say, it is written, I hope you say it with all of your heart, with everything in you, like you believe God, like you trust God, like you hide his word in your heart, and the next time you're tempted, you look at that thing or you look away from that thing. How about that? Or you look, or, or you, you're, you take that thought cap captive and you say, it is written. And you trust God and that what God has for you is better than anything in this world and what this world has for you. Genesis 3 records the first time that Adam and Eve sinned. They were tempted by Satan. It's significant to note that Satan questioned God's word. You can see this in Genesis chapter 3. And guess what Adam and Eve did not recall? They did not recall God's word. They did not cling to what God had already said. They did not say, well, he already said, right? It won't, I don't guess it was written at that time, okay? So for them, it, it would have been, hey, you know what, Satan? He already said this. He already said what he said. And when God says what he says, he means what he says. He's perfect. You can't change it, enemy. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm facing, and listen, I want you to know, church family, there are people sitting in this room with addictions. There are people sitting in this room with heartache. There's people sitting in this room with anxiety. There's people sitting in this room with fear. And the enemy wants you to live there. But God has something better for you. Or, or he has, he, 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 ha, he provisionally wants to help you in those weaknesses to experience victory and to be more than conquerors, the Bible says. You see, the greatest tool of the enemy is, is, is the lies that he uses, uses against us. The greatest, one, one of the greatest tools that the enemy has to use against us is a lie. It, the, I'm going to define a lie for you. A, a lie is bearing false witness. You see, the enemy bears false witness against the truth. And he uses that against us all the time. The enemy wants you to break faith. In God. You wake up in the morning and you say, God's got this. God's got this day. I'm giving this day to God. The enemy comes along. Oh, really? God's got this? Does he really have this? Maybe you need to work a little harder. Oh, 
don't you know how much you do? It's okay to do a little bit of this. It's okay to go over here for a minute. You see, the enemy is all about wanting you to break faith, that what God has for you is better, it's best, it's perfect. And so he's, this is what he's about. So we overcome Satan. I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. We overcome Satan, his agent, his agents, the evil influence, the, the demonic influence in the world. We overcome Satan, his agents, and his influence as we resist his temptations to doubt, deny, disregard, and disobey the word of God. Matt's going to come up in just a a little bit, and he's going to talk to us about something we've created to help us over the weeks ahead. Something to remind us that we need God's Word down in our heart. Something to remind us that we overcome Satan, his angels, his, his angels, his influence as we resist his temptations to doubt, deny, disregard, and disobey the Word of God. If you go ahead and stand with me in closing... Whether you're here in person or whether you're online or listening from wherever you may be, today needs to be a different day, church. It needs to be a different day for me. I I know what it's like to battle in life. My guess is you do too. My guess is you know today that it's a fight. But there's something beautiful about today. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yeah, amen. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because see, he already won the battle. We already are victorious if Jesus is in us. We already have the victory in Jesus. And so we learn from him and we look to him and we we understand that if he is in us and we will take that offensive weapon, the word of God, and and we will trust and we will believe, and we will lean on Jesus, then we know that temptation doesn't have to be something that overcomes us all the time. We can have victory. If you're in this room, and you're, and you're, and you're struggling with an addiction, God wants to deliver you from that addiction, and there's something that you need to do, though. You say, well, I've tried it all. You gotta try Jesus. You have to go, I can't do it. And go, he, and understand that Jesus already did it when he gave his life on the cross. And three of the most powerful words in the universe are, it is written that Jesus went to the cross and died and rose again on the third day and promised that whoever believeth in him shall have eternal life. And if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus this morning, today is the day. He will forgive you of all your sins. And as you lean on him and as you learn his word, he will help you to be an overcomer in this world. Bow your heads and close your eyes, and if there's anyone that's in here today, first of all, I don't want you to run to the Father and accept Jesus Christ just because of your addiction. I want to tell you that you want to run to the Father and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior because He loves you. He gave His life for you. And so if there's anyone in here and you You've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You're online, you're listening. You've never said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Take my life. Here I am. It is yours. Save me. Today is the day of salvation. So I invite you to pray not to me, but to God, the creator of the world, and say, 
God, here I am. My name is. I know you already know me. You know my struggles and my weaknesses. You know I'm a sinner. Father, I turn to you. I look to you. I ask you to save me and to take my life. Father, I accept Jesus into my life. I accept what he did for me. And I want you to teach me what it means to live for you. And I want to know your word. And I want to believe you and take you at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a believer in this place and it's been a while since you just lifted your hands and you just, it's been a while since you said, you know what? I do have victory. He is my savior. I just want to invite you to, to, with the worship team as they lead us in worship, lift up your hands, sing to God, give him some praise, all right? tell you what, I tell you what's coming, the battle. It's coming. It's on its way. Because some of you in here this morning, you started to feel a little bit of victory. You went, okay, I want it. And here's the, here, here's the thing with a battle. You got to look forward to it. Some of us were like, I don't want to deal with any temptation. I don't want to deal with any battles. Please, Lord, no battles, no temptation. When the temptation comes, you know what that is? That's opportunity. It's opportunity to say, oh yeah? Guess what? I've got God. Satan, you're not gonna win the battle, not because of me, not because of how great I am, but because how great a God that's within me. So this morning, I want you to do this. You ready? Take out your phone. Go ahead, grab it. I'm watching. Some of you aren't taking out your phone. Get your phone out. Go ahead and put the slide up. I want you to text wallpaper to this number, 317-680-5410. If you're online, go ahead and get your phone out uh, or write this down so you don't have to get out of watching what's going on. Text wallpaper to 317-680-5410. You can also save that number as Hamilton Hills Church. You can text in needs, requests, all that kind of stuff, but text wallpaper and you'll get a link to a wallpaper to put on your phone and it has the sermon series plus this verse that Pastor Randall just mentioned, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So when the battle comes, we're gonna look out, 
get your phone out. Instead of falling into temptation, we're going to rest in what God's word says. He that is in you is greater than any temptation, any battle, any person, anything that's coming against you. We love you. Hey, real quickly, I want to throw up the giving slide. Many of you have been faithful in partnering with us with giving. You got three ways you can do it in person, boxes in the back, also online at hamiltonhills.org, or you can text the amount to give. We love you. We'll see you back here next week. Go Colts. Yeah, all right. Some of you got more excited about that. <laughs>